Okay, some more instructions spoken by Vidura. Yeah, or questions more or less. And statements of fact. By his self-sheltered potency of the three modes of material nature, the Lord has created the creation of this universe. Mm -hmm. By his self-sheltered potency of the three modes of material nature, the Lord has created, caused the creation of this universe. By her, he maintains the creation and conversely dissolves it again and again. Mm -hmm. A little hard to understand that statement. Maybe if we repeat it, we'll get more knowledge. By his self-sheltered potency, self potency of the three modes of material nature, the Lord has created, Lord has I'm sorry, created. the Lord has caused the creation of this universe. By her, he maintains the creation and conversely dissolves it again and again. Hmm. Purport, not so long. This cosmic universe is created by the Lord for those living entities who are carried away by the illusionary thought of becoming one with him by imitation. The three modes of material nature are for the further bewilderment of the conditioned souls. The conditioned living entity, bewildered by the illusionary energy, considers himself a part of this material creation due to forgetfulness of his spiritual identity, and thus he becomes entangled in material activities, life after life. This world is not for the purpose of the Lord himself, but is for the conditioned souls who wanted to be controllers due to misuse of their God-gifted minute independence. Thus, the conditioned souls are subjected to repeated birth and death. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Srivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so, as the state creates the prison house for those rebellious souls who cannot follow the laws of the state, the Lord creates the material energy for the imprisonment of the conditioned souls who refuse to follow the, the guidance of the Lord. That, that, gui that lack of guidance of the Lord is called the misuse of independence. It's explained that the Lord is Swarat. Swarat means completely independent. He is Nitya Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam Eko Yogadadati Kaman. He maintains everyone. No one, he is not maintained by anyone. There's no one greater or equal to him. <laughs> He's come totally independent. <laughs> but because we are also connected with Krishna, we are what is called a fragmental energy of Krishna's existence. We are also of the same quality in smaller quantity. And one of the characteristics of that smaller, of that that uh, same quantity and quality is the nature of independence. So the living entity always has independence, either in the spiritual world or even anywhere in, in anywhere in existence that living entity has that 
what we call minute independence. It's not as great as Krishna. What is our independence? Our independence is to choose between the spiritual and the material. One of the principles of spiritual life is the Lord is the supreme controller. He controls everything directly and indirectly through his various energies. So we also have that tendency to control. But in the spiritual world, there's only one controller, and that is Krishna. Everyone is meant to be controlled by the Lord, either through the spiritual energy or through the material energy. If we accept the control of Krishna through the spiritual energy, that we are happy, peaceful, and joy, and uh, we make progress in life. If we try to control outside of that, or in the material energy, then we have to struggle to find happiness, and we generally wind up just going from one material situation to another, trying to eke out some happiness. So this per principle of being subordinate is always there to the living entity. We cannot be, we're not in a, a superior position. We're either subordinate to the Lord or we're subordinate to the Lord in the form of his material energy, either one. So under the material energy, as we mentioned, the state creates the prison house. So those who want to be independent of the Lord and want to be their own controllers because controller indicates enjoyer. People want to control so they can enjoy. But there's only one controller, and real enjoyment is not based on one's being in an independent controller, but accepting the control of the Lord. By accepting the control of the Lord, we connect with the Lord, and we get all the mercy of His association, and at the same time, all the benefits of our own nature. In other words, we get knowledge, we get happiness, we get freedom. Real freedom is on the spiritual platform. Even people in this world, they try to be free. But mm, they create different ideas on how to release themselves from different kinds of freedom. The worst form is a person doesn't want to follow any rules or regulations and they break every law. And then they wind up either hurting themselves or getting punished for their activities. So no one can be free in this world, but on the spiritual platform, freedom exists because freedom is in connection with the, our nature as spiritual beings. We're not limited on the spiritual platform. The only limitation in the spiritual platform is that our freedom is meant to be used for the service of the Lord which is part of our freedom anyway. So if we don't serve the Lord, we don't, we're not free. <laughs> because Krishna is free, when we serve him, we're free also. <laughs> so you connect with someone who is free, you also become free. <laughs> but not through his external energy. And so the Lord creates the external energy for those who are rebellious against the Lord's uh, will. And that is what this material world is about. So the purpose of the material world is to facilitate the desires of the living entity to act independent of the Lord. That's all. So when I, what is the purpose of this world? That's the only purpose. To somehow or other allow the living... There are actually just two purposes, but both are connected. To allow the living entities in this world to somehow or other uh, have the idea that they are free. It's, a, it's, a, it's an illusion. It's called, a, it's called maya, anyway. And what that means is that one thinks they're free because the propensity for independence is still there, even in the conditioned state. So using that, that, use, that independence to try to enjoy the material world, the living entity guy thinks that they are free from control, but they're under the control of the three modes of innate. Daiviyesha gunamayi mama maya darateya mama eva ye prapadyante maya etam tarantite. These three modes of material nature are divi. 
they're Krishna's energy and to cross beyond them is very difficult. So the living entities are locked up in this material world by their own misuse of the freedom. And the locking principle is desires to be independent of the Lord or to enjoy independent of the Lord. <laughs> and the, the epitome of that desire is sex life. And that's why this material world is called Maitunya Agra. Maitunya means sex and Agra means chains. That the living entity is chained by this desire to enjoy the opposite sex. And that's the hardest and most steel frame chain there is. And every living entity is based, is more or less locked up on that because the goal of everything they do is to enjoy that is called what is called the Adi Ras of material life, sex life. Now, where does that where does that element come from? It comes from our nature to serve the Lord. In other words, there is a energy, it's called the Adiras energy, or original nature to give pleasure to the Lord. And when that energy to give pleasure to the Lord is diverted away from the Lord, we try to give pleasure to ourselves, and that takes the highest form in the form of sex desire, <laughs> or sex activities, and therefore the living entity so you ask, well, where does that propensity for sex life come? It's natural, but it's perverted in an in a unnatural way. In other words, it's twisted around. The desire to please the Lord and serve the Lord is re-diverted towards the external energy in the form of the opposite sex. And therefore, everyone works hard simply for that. That's all. <laughs> That's what it's all about. That's what this whole material world is. And if you can break that attachment through the power of reconnecting yourself with devotion to the Supreme Lord and developing a, a higher taste, Visaya Vini Vartante Niharasya Dehinam, Raso Vyasya, Viso Pyasya, Param Driswa Nivartante. One cannot give up the lower taste unless they get a higher taste. One can refrain from the lower taste without having the higher taste for some small period of time. But because life is about taste, one has to somehow or other find taste somewhere. So, but the high, but higher taste, param drisva, the highest taste is our happiness that we experience when we engage in devotional service to the Lord. And that is the higher taste. <laughs> And that taste increases as we continue in that process. And the essence of that taste is to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. And the essence of that essence is to engage in Harinam Sankirtan. Uh, what is that? Krishna Varnam Tusa Krishna Sangopanga Saparshadam Yagyai Sankirtanai Prayaya Janti Hisumeda Saha. It's called a yagya, but that yagya is the purifying process by which one awakens what is called the highest form of one's desire to experience pleasure in the form of the holy name. Because the holy name is manifested as Krishna himself. It's not different than Krishna. Kali Kale Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar Nama Hoite Haya Sarva Jagat Nistara Krishna is incarnated in himself in the form of his name. His name is him. There is no difference. Nama Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Hunya Sudya Nitya Mukta Abhinna Tvam Nami Nami No. Abhinna. Abhinna means different. Abhinna means the same. What, something, what, is, what is the same? Nami and Nam. The name and the who, who is being named is exactly the same. There's not a slightest bit of difference in Krishna and his name. There's where the higher pleasure exists, in the holy name. So one who develops a taste for chanting the holy name will, again, lose that taste to enjoy in this material world. And they can break the shackles of the attachments in this world, which is epitomized by the desire to enjoy the opposite sex. Prabhupada said, if there was no sex life in this world, nobody would do anything. <laughs>
No one would go to work, no one would do anything. <laughs> it's all centered around that one principle. <laughs> but there is a higher taste, and that higher taste is the one, one spiritual nature connected to Krishna in devotion. And when it's glorified in giving Krishna pleasure through chanting his holy name, it awakens unlimited pleasure. Anandam buddhi vardhanam. Uh -huh. Chaito darpanam marjanam am bhava maha dervagni nirvapanam shreya kaiva vachanrika vitaranam vidyavadhu jivanam anandam bhudi vardanam pratipadam purnam rita swadanam sarvatma snaparam param vijayate si krishna shankirtana cleanses the mind and the heart, pushes back the fire of material existence awakens one's good fortune, reveals transcendental knowledge, it's an ocean of unlimited happiness, it awakens one's eternal nature with Krishna in the spiritual world and purifies everything in one's existence. These are the seven benedictions that come by chanting of the holy name. So we mentioned that one, Anandam Bhudi Vardhanam. Ananda, obviously Ananda means joyfulness or blissfulness, Bodhi means great or deep in this particular translation, and Vardhanam means ocean. There's an unlimited deep ocean of transcendental nectar that is connected with Krishna's holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So there's the higher taste. And once we develop that higher taste through chanting, but chanting is not isolated. And it has to accompany one other factor. Otherwise, it won't develop beyond, beyond a certain part. And that is Gopi Bhatta Bhatta Kamalayor Dasa Dasa on the dice. One has to serve the Vaishnavas. Lord Chaitanya emphasized three principles on his teachings. Vaishnav Seva, Jiva Doya, and Nam Ruchi. These are the three factors that when all, when all three are there, one is experiencing transcendental happiness all constantly. What are those three? A taste for chanting of the holy name. A desire to serve the Vaishnavas and a desire to give the message of, the, of, of Lord Chaitanya to the conditioned souls. These are the three principles that are, make up the entire process of Lord Chaitanya's mission. But we say the most important is chanting, but chanting, yes, but chanting will not develop beyond a point unless we uh, serve the Vaishnavas. If you do those two, chanting will develop. But if you want to take it to an even higher level, then preach Krishna consciousness. These are the three aspects. But with Vaishnav Seva alone and with uh, Nam Ruchi, these two will spiral one higher, higher in Krishna consciousness. And that Vaishnav Seva has to be active. It cannot be passive. What does that mean? One has to think of ways to serve the Vaishnavas. And I think, well, if it comes along and I get a chance to serve the devotees, then I'll do it. No, it doesn't work like that. You have to be thinking of ways of how you can serve the Vaishnavas and look for every opportunity to carry it out. Then, through that mood, then your chanting will expand and expand and expand more and more. Because we, we talk about how to chant the holy name, but the essence of the, of the chanting is that Krishna is pleased when he sees his devotee serving others in the mood of pleasing others. In other words, one, 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 is actually, one is actually pleasing Krishna by pleasing those in connection with Krishna. <laughs> and that is the process like that. Now, this is the key to Krishna consciousness. We get right to the heart of the essence here. So try to serve the Vaishnavas and chant the holy names of the Lord. Emphasize these two things. And, of course, we can't get away from Vaishnav Seva, but we should never consider it to be a burden. 
we should always consider to be an opportunity for pleasing Krishna and for pleasing those persons who we offer service to. And that's the principle of, of life. And no one can be happy when they try to please themselves. It's not possible. <laughs> First of all, you don't know how to do it, <laughs> although you think you do. <laughs> and the second thing is that when we uh, try to please ourselves, um, we think ourselves as the body, and therefore we're looking for that. But the pleasure that comes by placing at one's actual self is the soul itself, and that soul is intimately and eternally connected to Krishna. So you can't somehow please yourself without pleasing Krishna, because when you please Krishna, you please yourself. And if you try to please yourself, you don't please either yourself or Krishna. You might say, well, I'm pretty good at pleasing myself. You might go on for a little while, but after a while, it, it, it'll fall apart. It doesn't last more than a few moments <laughs> like that. So this is the key in Krishna consciousness here. And so this material world is, and we forgot to mention the second, and the first point is mentioned here, that Krishna can de creates this material world. Why? So the living entities want to be independent of the Lord and enjoy separately. Therefore, he allows that facility to happen by creating this material world. You can't do it in the spiritual world. The spiritual world, the only enjoyer is Krishna and everyone enjoys it by serving him. Here, everyone wants to be independent of Krishna and everyone wants to forget Krishna because in this material world, when people remember God, they think of someone who is giving them rules and regulations in life that they don't like. <laughs> That's what they see God as. Someone who is restricting my ha happiness, my independence, my freedom, my ability to choose. <laughs> That's how they see uh, God. But the other feature in this material world is that this material world is meant to correct that wayward tendency, which causes the living entity to come here in the first place. So it's like a prison. When you go into the prison, you're supposed to get two things. You're supposed to get punishment and correction. So this material world, if you use an analogy, prison house is a perfect analogy. Because this is what this material world is designed for, to punish the living entities by becoming separate from the Lord, and by creating a situation where they can again revive their eternal loving relationship with the Lord and get out of the material world. <laughs> so that's what the purpose of this world is. Someone asks you, what's the purpose of this world? The purpose of this world is to get out of it. <laughs> what's the purpose of it? It's, it's compared to a bathroom. <clears throat> you have to go to the bathroom, so you, you go into that little room, that's the smallest place in the house, and you, in, you, know, you do your duty, and then you get out. <laughs> you don't think, well, I'm going to set up my dining table there, and uh, my lounge chair, and I'll bring in my television, and, and then you know, I'll uh, invite my friends all to come into the bathroom, and we'll have a big bath together. <laughs> It's not, like, it's, like, it's not like that. The bathroom is just what it is. Just to do your duty and get out. <laughs> so this is what the material world, and Prabhupada has used this analogy. He said this material world is like a bathroom. <laughs> and he says the living entities have simply come to this material world to pass stool and urine, that's all. <laughs> it's the only reason we've come here. <laughs> So, you know, you actually understand what this place is like, but the idea is to get out of it. And what is the, what is the release button or the process of getting to get out of this material world is the process of devotional service. So one has to take devotional service seriously. 
Otherwise, it's a, as Prabhupada ends the purport, the living entities can constantly subject it to birth after birth. Mayadavatse kachyo beshe kachyo ha bububai jeev krishna das e vishwash kale dara dukanai bhakti vinoda kaur sings that the living entity is being tossed by the waves of the material energy life after life after life and but he's krishna das and he thinks he's you know uh yeah, yeah. Croatia Das or <laughs> United States Das <laughs> or my wife Das, my husband Das. <laughs> so many Dases we throw on the end of the name. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur makes this point. <clears throat> and just like straws are floating in the ocean, and the ocean is turbulent, and so the waves are moving in different ways. And sometimes two straws come together, and then the wave brings them up, and then the wave brings them down, and then the straws go away in a different way. So we meet living entities. We meet somebody in this the world that's our father, our mother, our brother, our sister, the president of Croatia, um, you know, the the police officer. We meet so many living entities. These are like the straws we meet when the wave goes up and then the wave comes down and it's the end of that relationship and then we float in the ocean of material existence looking for another straw to connect with. So this is the material world, life after life after life. The conditioned soul is thrown in so many awkward situations, trying to find happiness, but being tossed around life after life. Karno guna sango so sadasa joni janmasu. And Prabhupada takes it a little farther. He says, sometimes you take birth in the higher planets as a demigod, and sometimes you take birth on this planet as a human, or sometimes you take birth in the lower planets as a, uh, an animal or even a lower birth on this planet as an animal. So the material energies, as Prabhupada mentions here, the three modes of material energy are, are created by Krishna. He created these three material energies and he put them in place to work in a certain way. Just like when you go into the prison house, you get, there's about three different compartments you can go in the prison house. The three modes of material nature. The prison house is the ideal example. <clears throat> Mainstream prisoners are like the mode of passion. Those are the ones that have been put in jail and they're following the rules of the jail. And they're they're working, they're you know, they're doing whatever they're doing, and then they're locked up from time to time and then they get some release. And then those who fight against the administration in the jails who cross trouble. They're taken away from the mainstream and thrown into the uh, into a what is called solitary confinement, where they have to stay by themselves in a very small place, and their food is given to them through the door once a day. That's called the mode of ignorance. And then you have the prisoners that are really following nicely, work so nicely, also serve their other fellow prisoners. They are good prisoners, so they're given some position in the prison. They're in charge of the law library. They give them the key. You can open the door and let all the other prisoners in, or you can be in charge of this area here. They give them... I've been to many prisoners, prisons because I've seen what is called privileged prisoners. And they have a little bit of a... They're not the mainstream. They have some little workforce in, the, in there, that gives them control to some of the other activities. So that's like the mode of goodness. So do you see the three modes are there in the prisons itself. And so this is what this material world is like. That's all it is. And so one should not try to stay here. <laughs> one should try to get out. Not that we should try to make a better arrangement just so we can enjoy at a higher point. Sometimes Prabhupada used to, would say sometimes, he said, many of my disciples will attain Swargaloka. 
That means they won't make it back to the spiritual world. They'll do enough devotional service and, then, and at that one point they'll be qualified to take birth in the higher planets. And they'll get a position as some kind of demigod or semigod. There are different levels of demigods. There's, there's actually three realms of demigods too. Highest demigods, the middles, and then there are the lower demigods like that. And so you can get into one of those three realms of the demigods also. And there, life is longer, there's less suffering, and, and the uh, sense enjoyment is greater than on this planet. <clears throat> it says that the, the women on this planet compared to the ladies in the higher planets are, look like horses. I didn't say that, and Prabhupada said that. <laughs> the women on the higher planets are so beautiful. And sometimes they come here and they attract the conditioned souls here. It's like, Irma, what was her name? Irvasi, she came here and then she had a relation with, who was his name? Purushottam in the ninth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, you know that? Yeah. yeah and she had all her conditions. He wanted to marry a, you know, someone from the higher planet, Sarvasi came. She said, all right, <clears throat> I'll become your wife, but two conditions. One, everything you, uh, I eat has to be cooked in ghee, and I should never see you naked. <laughs> so he was thinking, it's not so hard. I'll work out that one. I get this beautiful, you know, <clears throat> you know, beautiful heavenly damsel, and you know, I can provide all. The, he was a king. I can provide everything she needs for you know, nice food, ghee, ghee, ghee cooked food, and he was careful always to remain clothed in her presence. Of course, they had children together. But then one day, and she had two pet lambs. And uh, one day, uh, the lambs were, were stolen. And she couldn't find the lambs. And she was, what happened to my lambs? She really was attached to these two lambs. So she calls her husband, please find my lambs. So he was sleeping, but he was sleeping naked. <laughs> and so when he got up to run to find her lambs, as she called, he was running naked, looking for the lambs. And she said, oh, that's it, the end of the program. <laughs> and she decided, uh, now I'm going back to the heavenly planets. And she left, and he was like broken. He didn't know what to do. He did everything to try to convince her not to go, and she said, that was the agreement. <laughs> she went back to her heavenly planets. Uh, she was punished to come here to take birth, to take to become his, uh, his wife because she did something wrong in the heavenly planets. And so that was the conditions for getting her out. If he broke these conditions, then she would go back to the heavenly planets. Because those who, are, who live on the heavenly planets, when they see this place, they think, my God, who wants to live here? <laughs> it's, like, it's like for dogs. <laughs> but they say, you can get used to anything and think it's nice, right? <laughs> you can be living in hell and you can think, hmm. Yeah, I know it's hell, but let me try to make it nice. <laughs> and so you can somehow or other try to create a better hell. And then you think, well, it's not hell anymore. Prabhupada tells the story of uh, the one miner, he was preaching in Sethfield in, in the UK, Sethfield, England. And so these miners, they were working in the coal mine, and one priest, he wanted to preach to these coal miners. It was kind of a secluded town, and they were mostly all coal miners in the town. So, um, well, that's, that's another story. 
Oh, there was one, <clears throat> no, one, one person was saying, here's another story, here's the other, here's the X story. Um, one priest, he wanted to preach to one person who was a drunkard. <clears throat> so he's preaching him that you're a drunkard, you're drinking, that's sinful, and if you continue, you're going to go to hell. He said, yes, but my, my father's a drunkard also. Yes, he'll go to hell too. My mother, she also drinks. She'll go to hell too. And my relatives, my uncles, they also drink. They all go to hell too. Oh, well, that's nice. We'll all be together in hell. <laughs> And so, yeah, it's not hell anymore. We'll, we'll all be together. It's like heaven. <laughs> Why split the happy family? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we can, in hell, we can get as much liquor as we want. <laughs> and so, yeah, this is the material world. It's material happiness is like grabbing smoke. That's a good analogy. You see smoke flying in the air, right? You can see it. You see it, there's the smoke. So you just go, where'd it go? It's not here. Oh, there it is. Oh, got it. <laughs> That's material happiness. You see it. <laughs> Look, it's there. You see it, I see it, we all see it, right? <laughs> you go for it, and what do you get? Nothing. <laughs> but it's not even that good. Not only do you get nothing, you get, you get the pain of getting something you don't really want. <laughs> That's material happiness. Turns into material suffering. So this material world is what it is. It's just, it's a prison house for the, for the soul who wants to be separate from the Lord. But okay, you might say, I don't even remember thinking like that. Well, somehow that is called Maya. Maya makes us forget why we came here. But it's a fact. No one's in this material world unless they had rebelled against God. The only ones that are in this material world who haven't rebelled against God are those who come here to save the rebellious souls. <laughs> the, in, the enlightened souls who are sent by the Lord to preach God consciousness. Those are the ones who are Nitya Siddhas who never touched. And Prabhupada was one such person. He came to save all of us. <laughs> Otherwise we're all criminals. We have to eat, we have to take bread and water. That's our food. <laughs> That's what we always say that. If you go to jail, they give you bread and water, right? That's the way it used to be. Now they, it's a little bit better. They give you bread, water, and chickpeas. <laughs> That's about it. Maybe some rotten grapes or something, so once in a while. So this is the material world. There's no enjoyment in this world. It's only a struggle for enjoyment. But the conditioned soul's nature is to want to enjoy, therefore it can't give up this desire to enjoy. And it thinks, I'm not enjoying now, but I'll enjoy in the future. And so that's what keeps the living entity going. I'm not happy now, I'm not enjoying now, but if I keep going and I make my plans, it'll get better. <laughs> it'll get better because I'm intelligent. But Prabhu, nobody else is enjoying. Yeah, I know because they don't know how to enjoy. <laughs> I have the secret. And once I make it, once I do it, I'll patent it and then I'll sell it to everybody. Huh? 
you might try to enjoy with the new technologies that we have. So it's uh, new possibilities. <laughs> Well, they think like that, yeah. And some technology will come up with something that is eternally enjoyable. The cell phone, the cell phone that you can have a transplant and you can put it into your head so you don't have to do anything but just move your head like this and it works, you know. <laughs> You don't have to carry it around and lose it. <laughs> yeah, technology is the, the, the greatest and the, the, the most modern form of Maya's tricks. We were at a university in Boston many years ago. I was with one devotee. And we were preaching to students, and they were mostly Indian students. Northeastern University. And, and we started to talk about the the, the downfall of, or not the downfall, or the, this, the what cell phones are really about, <laughs> how they divert your attention away from, from everything. So I, um, I didn't say much, but the devotee who was with me, he was preaching really heavy against cell phones. And uh, <clears throat> at the end, after the questions were over, there were a few questions. One of the students came up to me and said, uh, Swami, you know, if I'm not with my cell phone for six minutes, I go crazy. And he was serious. He wasn't just making some you know, grand statement. He said, if I don't have my cell phone for six minutes, I go crazy. He was really addicted. There are people, this is a new kind of addiction now. People who are addicted to drugs. There's Drugs Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, Sex Anonymous. There are people who are addicted to sex life. They have these clubs now. Sex Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous. Oh, Shopaholics. Shopaholics. Instead of alcoholics, shopaholics. Going shopping. Uh -huh. they, there are people who are addicted to shopping. I have articles that were written in newspapers about ladies who work as secretaries and when they get their lunch break, they go out and buy four or five hundred dollars worth of stuff. And then they just throw it in their closet. And they just, they want to shop all the time. They usually run up a lot of debts. They can't pay their debts after the while and they go bankrupt. And then, uh, because in, in America, if you can't pay after a while, you just declare bankruptcy and nobody can do anything to you. They do that. People do that. They just run up big bills and don't pay anything. <laughs> And so, yeah, shopaholics, it's a disease. It's got to buy more, something new, something different. So this material world is a crazy place. As Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati would say, no place for a gentleman or a gentle lady. In other words, the one who has intelligence will understand this is not, this is not a nice place. <laughs> So the idea is don't try to be happy here. <laughs> Give up the idea of trying to be happy. Prahlad Maharaj says, if you want to be happy, do one thing. Stop trying to be happy. He says that. And if you're trying to be happy, you don't, you'll miss it. But if you try to serve Krishna, you'll be happy. <laughs> But we're serving Krishna and we're thinking, hmm, I need this. I'm going to serve you, Krishna, because I need this. <laughs> I need that husband, I need that wife, I need that money, I need that job, I need that position. I need that. So, Krishna, you are the all-powerful, 
supreme supplier of everything. So please, I'm chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare husband, Hare husband, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Waifa, Hare Waifa, Waifa Waifa, Hare Waifa, Wife Wife. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, husband, husband. Hare Waifa, Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. <laughs> So, yeah, so forget all that, just chant the holy names and serve the Lord. And Krishna will say, oh, that devotee is so surrendered to me. All right, I'll give her a husband. <laughs> all right, I'll give him a wife. <laughs> That's how it works. If we please Krishna, Krishna knows what we need and he provides everything. And when we start looking for it independently of devotional service, we waste time and we devote our attention away for the real goal of life. Because everything material in this world is subject to the time element. So we don't need anything. <laughs> the one devotee says, you only need three things in Krishna consciousness. One, the holy name. Two, association with devotees. And three, prasadam. That's all. And that's already provided, right? <laughs> So once you have those three things, everything else is extra. There's always prasadam, right? We can always chant the holy name and we, association is available. Anything else we need? Chant the holy name. Hmm? Chant the holy name. What else we need? And chanting the holy name, prasadam, and association. What else? Well, I need my car so I can get to the temple, right? <laughs> okay. All right, so this world is, uh, devotional service is about reducing your needs and increasing your devotional activities. Okay, I'll stop there. <clears throat> yes, Hare Krishna. Well, there is a condition. If you want to be happy with him, you have to understand that service to him is the principle of being happy. If we give up that service, we give up him. <laughs> he doesn't give us up, we give him up. <laughs> He's not giving us up. He's trying to get us back. We give him up. And that's why we come here, because we... We decided to be independent. As we mentioned, every living entity has free will, and the misuse of free will is what, we, what causes us to come to this world. You went shopping and you bought the wrong thing and now you can't return it because it says not returnable. Does that help? Krishna doesn't give us up. We give him up. But we, when we feel like, well, I want to get back to Krishna, then it's just a matter of time before you're back there again. We can't, you, you're thinking, I never gave up Krishna. You're thinking like that, right? Because the basis of happiness is love. <laughs> love is the, the nature of all living entities. Without him, you can't be happy without love. <clears throat> and in this material world, 
What goes on is love, is selfishness. It's not love. Real love is selfless. <clears throat> so loving him means being connected to him again. <laughs> Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sarukabu Noi Sravanadi Siddhi Chitte Kodiye Udoi. In the hearts of all living entities, love for Krishna is there. You have love for Krishna, we all have love for Krishna, but it's called Gupta. It's hidden, it's covered. When you find that love in your heart, then when you offer that love to Krishna in devotion, then you are connected with Krishna again, and then you'll be happy. Automatically. Just like <clears throat> if a fire is a distance away, you may see the light, but you can't feel the heat because it's so far away. You start getting closer to the fire, and the light becomes brighter, and the heat be start, you start feeling the heat. The more you get closer to Krishna, the more you become happy. The more you get Krishna closer to Krishna, the more you become full of knowledge. That's all. Love is the connecting force, and, the, and service is what connects love. Without service, there's no connecting. You can't connect your love. You can't say, I love Krishna, but I don't serve him. It's not possible. <laughs> Why? Because you have to serve. <clears throat> if you're not serving Krishna, you're serving the material energy. So to, in order to connect that love back to Krishna, you have to serve Krishna. You can't be happy separate. It's not possible. It's like I'm, it's like saying <clears throat> it's like I want to I I want to enjoy the food without eating. <laughs> How can you enjoy the food without eating? You see, you have to eat. <laughs> I want to I want to love Krishna without serving Krishna. It's not possible. You get a little traction for Krishna, and that is a preliminary stage, but that little attraction causes you to want to serve Krishna. <laughs> if it doesn't, then that attraction will you'll lose that after a while. Because service brings it can brings it closer. <clears throat> Just like a harmonium. <clears throat> if you don't play a harmonium, it doesn't sound so good. But the more you play it, the sweeter the harmonium gets. <laughs> the more you serve Krishna, <clears throat> the more your love will awaken. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah, it's all about service. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Mergendra. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, you mentioned that Prabhupada said that uh, most of his disciples or some at least will go to school. He said many. Many of his disciples will, will attain Swarga Loka. That means they'll give up the process of pure devotional service at one point. We know that uh, if one has begun devotional service, one inevitably continues, and uh, it's permanent asset, but one be carried yeah. on life after life. So what happens to those who, after uh, this life, attain Svarga Loka and live long enough to miss? Uh, then when Svarga Loka is, is like putting gas in your car, and being in Svarga Loka is like driving. After some time, the gas will run out, and then you'll fall down. Shinya puni martya vishanti, which means that you go up, and then after some time, when your pious activities, devotional credits run out, you fall down to this level again, take birth as a human being, maybe, and then start again where you left off. So that person will, who did some devotional service, 
They'll go up to the high heavenly planets, enjoy for a while in the heavenly planets, come back down and start where they left off from their previous life in devotional service. But Lord Chaitanya's mission will be somewhere. <laughs> as long as Kali Yuga is on, the mission is on. <laughs> But Krishna will arrange for a person to, to, you know, begin where they left off. Mm -hmm. What is that word? Uh, deviate? No, 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 what's the word? Huh? No. Uh, spoken by Prahlad Maharaj. that one takes birth accordingly. First verse in one chapter, I forget is it. Karma Daivana Trina. That's it. Karma Daivana Trina. By one's previous karma, one will take birth accordingly. <laughs> It's kind of, this is one thing that's a little unclear. Because <clears throat> when you go to the heavenly planets, you're burning off a lot of your pious credits. So you could also fall down very low when you come back down. But those who have devotional credits, they will, if they, if they when they get to the heavenly planets, they'll want to take birth again in, in Lord Chaitanya's movement, generally. Because once you taste Krishna consciousness, material happiness is, is not very attractive. But you still have choice. But you can go up from the heavenly planets too, if you take devotional service. But generally, because of too much material opulences, people forget. I mean, if you could, but. <laughs> But Prabodhananda Saraswati says, Kaivalya Nyarakasre Dham. What does he say? Akash Pushpayate. <laughs> Akash means sky, Pushpayate means flowers. So he, he says, <coughs> he says, the happiness of, of the heavenly planets is like flowers in the sky. <coughs> What does that mean, flowers in the sky? It's an illusion. <laughs> flowers don't grow in the sky. Or he calls it the eggs of a horse. Horses don't lay eggs. <laughs> so, in other words, it's called phantasmagoria. It's a phantasmagoria. Because even in the heavenly planets, there is disturbances by the demons. You read the Bhagavatam, Indra, you know, he has to guard the heavenly planets. The demons are trying to take over there also. Uh, Indra is a Kshatriya. And he has, he has his weapons, and along with his demigods, they, they fight against the demons. That was the whole reason why Krishna came to the, mater to the material world 5,000 years ago. 
because there was a fight on the heavenly planets and the demons wanted to uh, find a base so they could fight the demigods, so they, they chose Earth. And they chose Earth, and while they were on Earth, they took, they took birth in different species of life. And gradually this planet became full of demons. And Kamsa and all of these ferocious demons that were attacking Krishna, they, uh, they were all powerful demons that were eventually fighting against the demigods, were looking for places. They wanted a base somewhere in the cosmos to fight the uh, demigods. So you read the Bhagavatam, there's always fights between the demigods. and So even in the heavenly planets, there's disturbances up there. <laughs> Some bhakti yoga who came uh, to this level that they were born in this uh, family. Yeah. And after that, it's not like go down. It's not that. Uh, yeah, there's many examples. Mm. Example is Bomasura. He was the son of Krishna born from the earth. And he became a demon because of bad association. So usually it's due to association. Prabhupada says, soon as you soon as you get into wrong association and then you fall down is beginning. Then you start to not follow the principles. So and then you start finding fault with the devotees. So the initial cause of Fall down is wrong association or materialistic association. That's what usually happens. Yeah, you can come back, give up that association and realize that, yeah, well, a lot of times they need special mercy to get back up, but yeah. It's, But you see, Pallad Maharaj was born in a family of demons. So some of us were born in, we were also born in demon families, <laughs> but somehow Prabhupada came along and picked us up. <laughs> I wasn't a demon, but I was close to it. <laughs> I actually, when I was a kid, I started my own baseball team. <laughs> I, yeah, we would have our, our little places, like we have our little cities, little townships, little cities, actually. And, and then I started my own township baseball team. And you want to know the, you want to know the name of the team? That we, I called it the demons. <laughs> and I, I started it and I named it. <laughs> and I had, I had black hats with a red D. <laughs> we had our own hats too. We were a pretty good baseball team. <laughs> <laughs> so there you can see the connection now. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, but the living entity always has its choice. And as long as the living entities is in this material world, if they're not pure devotees, they can fall down. The only time you can't fall down is when you have reached pure devotional service. Anyone can fall down at any time. Even devotees who are fixed in Krishna consciousness and been you know, engaging for so many years. And, but if they still have a little tiny 
tinge of material desire there. And they can, that little tinge can push them back to the material world. They can become demons again. You, know? you can go all the way up, but if you don't go to the top and stay there, then you can come all the way down again. <clears throat> Never think yourself safe in devotional service. That's, and that's Maya's illusion. Yeah, you're advanced, you're okay. <laughs> you're making nice progress. You're not gonna fall down. That's Maya tells you that. Yeah, you can, you know, go watch a movie once in a while. It's not gonna hurt. You're fixed up. It's like give you an example. It's kind of a thin example, but it's an example. <coughs> I don't know. <coughs> Is there any water here? Yes, I guess. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Example was one of Bhakti Siddhanta's leading sannyasis went out preaching, and he gave a astounding lecture, amazing lecture. He got a standing ovation from the crowd. It was such a powerful lecture he gave, and everyone thought this is amazing. Really powerful lecture. So, you know, he came back, he came back to the ashram, and he thought, I think I should treat myself to a little, you know, gift. I should give myself a little reward, you know. <laughs> so he decided, he asked for them to cook some of his favorite dishes for prasadam. <laughs> When Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had found out, he called him a hero rascal, you think that you're doing devotional service for your own benefit. So he, sh so he wanted to reward himself for an, out somewhat, an obviously outstanding service. And Bhakti Siddhanta said, this is another form of selfishness. <clears throat> I did nice service, so I should get something from it. Service is meant for... We benefit from our service, no doubt, but otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. But <clears throat> it doesn't come in the way of, I'll call it, you know, uh, trying to think what kind of benefit I should get from it. <laughs> the benefit is that you become Krishna conscious. The benefit is you make progress in knowledge. The benefit is you get free from material attachments. <clears throat> There's three benefits in devotional service. It mentions that. That one verse in the 11th canto, By engaging in devotional service, one gets happiness, awakens one's relationship with Krishna, and gets freedom from suffering. Just as the verse is compared to the eating process, just as when you eat, you get nourishment, your hunger is satisfied, and you get nourishment, your hunger is satisfied. Maybe force. Huh? Maybe force. You get nourishment, your hunger is satisfied, and you and you you feel happy when you eat. When you sit. Satisfaction, cessation of hunger, and uh, And three things mentioned. It's in the eleventh canto, eleventh chapter, verse second 
chapter 11 to 42. 11 to 42, I think it is. Devotion, direct experience of the Supreme Lord, and detachment from other things. These three occur simultaneously for one who has taken shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the same way that pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger come simultaneously and increasingly with each bite for a person engaged in eating. Yeah, that's the verse, yeah. So what are those three things again? Devotion, direct experience of the Supreme Lord, and detachment from other things are compared to pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger. Good. Yeah. Nice analogy. Okay, all right, Krishna. Feel a broad key.